So, uh, yeah, my name is uh, One. I get the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Russian Fellowship, uh, like Pastor Joro said. Uh, I'm going to jump straight in because we, uh, we have a lot to get through, and, uh, and I really think uh, today is going to be absolutely incredible. It's going to be uh, encouraging, it's going to be edifying, um, and as our guys figure out the, uh, the whole mic stuff, we'll, uh, we'll get into it. So, we, uh, we started last week. Uh, it's a two-part sermon series, so we're wrapping up today, so only two parts, uh, but talking about church and empire. And so I said last week that uh, uh, empires and nations come and go, but the church, the church of God continues forever. And so the question is, as the church, then uh, what is our responsibility? How, how are we to navigate in the spaces where we find ourselves, where we live work and play. And so uh, as uh, this year is an election year, it's an important year in the life of South Africa. W what is our responsibility as the local church? As Christians, how are we to engage uh, in the political and government arena? And so we unpacked last week that we are called to be salt and light. Uh, as the people of God, uh, we are called to be salty and we are called to be shiny. Now, I don't have time to get into all of that. Uh, if you weren't here last week, I'd encourage you to go and listen to uh, the message. Uh, but but the, here's the point. The point is that uh, God has not called us to live in our own spaces. God has not called us to just be in our own living rooms and go, you know what, I'm a Christian and I've got my ticket to heaven and so therefore I'm okay. No, no, no. God calls us to go out into the world. Uh, we are not uh, of the world, but we live in the world. Uh, and he calls us to those uh, various spaces so that we might be an influence of his kingdom for his glory. Amen. And so that's what we looked at uh, last week, uh, particularly looking at uh, the political and government arena as we are in an election year. And so I said last uh, Sunday that, that this Sunday, what we're going to do is we're not just going to uh, have a sermon preached to us, uh, but we're going to have a conversation. Uh, I, I want to uh, be able to, to give you the necessary tools uh, so that you might be able to engage in the political and government uh, arena because God calls us to that. And so uh, we have uh, uh, an individual who I'm going to call a friend. Uh, I know uh, we are meeting for the first time face-to-face -face today, uh, but we have engaged over Zoom, and uh, if COVID taught us anything, Zoom matters, yeah. right, 100%. Uh, and so I would say we are friends today, um, and, and we're going to have a little conversation. I'm going to ask her uh, just a number of questions, and we're going to go back and forth and, and see what it is that God has in store for us. I'm going to read uh, just a little bit about who he is, and, and you might go, wow, I know that's quite extensive, but I, I, I think that his experience and his wisdom and his discernment in this space is worthy of every single bit of ink that is on this page. All right, so I'm going to read to you a little bit about who he is, and then I'm going to call him up, and then uh, we're just going to chat a little bit, all right? So, so here's who we have uh, today with us uh, as our guest uh, this morning. It's Kahiso. Uh, affectionately known as TK. Uh, that's if you are friends with him. Uh, and so you guys will call him Kahiso. <laughs> but I will refer to him as TK. Um, so this is kind of his focus. So he's uh, uh, in the public policy research and planning space. Uh, and uh, he's, he does a number of things. Uh, I believe that uh, you are a PhD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you are in a comfortable space, because uh, I, I say here at Treaters Fellowship, we have a ton of doctors, but not necessarily the ones that you want when your life is, uh, is, is in need, right? But, uh, but you're in, in great space. So uh, TK currently works at the uh, Witt Vatisrand School of Governance, or at Witt, uh, teaching, supervising, and leading projects uh, looking into state-owned entities, uh, institutional analysis, development, and scenario planning. Uh, before joining uh, WITS, he worked with uh, various other institutions of higher learning, like uh, the Northwest uh, University, University of KZN, and the Gordon Institute of Business Science. Uh, before joining academia on a full-time basis, he worked as a uh, policy research 
consultant at the Gauteng Provincial uh, Legislature and uh, the Sibering District Municipality in the Integrated Development Planning Unit. Are you guys intrigued? Yes. Man. Over the last seven years, he has led various research and teaching projects focusing on a diverse set of problems like uh, illicit financial flows in the mining sector and how governments in the, hear this, hear this, he, he said here, republics of Botswana, but you guys know here, I call it the kingdom of Botswana. Let's give it the respect that it's due. Namibia, South Africa, and uh, Zimbabwe institutions uh, addressing uh, various problems of development. Uh, in addition to this, he worked at, uh, on scenario planning projects looking to assist the South African and several Southern African governments and business handling of future thinking planning in the mining, energy, and business sectors. Guys, you have no idea who's sitting before us today. Oh my goodness. In uh, 2019, he was awarded a fellowship for the managing global governance of the DAS. Am I saying it right? How do you say it in German? DAS. Das German Institute of Development and Sustainability. While in 2021, he worked uh, with the Presidential State-Owned Enterprise Council via Department of Public Enterprises, representing WITS uh, as uh, its acting head of the Secretary. As of 2023, he uh, heads the uh, WITS State-Owned Energy a transition consortium group focusing and providing complex policy to provide advice to the public, private, and interested parties. And here's, here's where uh, it matters most. Outside of his professional life, uh, he is a car guard. Look at all your faces. He is a car guard at every nation mid-rant on Sundays. So he loves the Lord. So even with everything that I've just said to you, he's going, you know what? And we said this last week. He goes, you know what? I have picked a side. As we navigate through all of this this year, he goes, no, no, no. As I come to make a decision about who I'm going to vote for and how I'm going to hold government accountable, he goes, you know what? I've already picked a side, though. And that is the kingdom of God. Uh, he served... Uh, on the board of members at uh, St. Luke's Anglican Church uh, in his hometown in the Val. And is South African, uh, he loves South African jazz and old school R&B. Ooh, all of a sudden you guys are interested. Before you were like, ah, you know, all those things, yeah, whatever. But when I said R&B, it's like, yes, yes, we're ready to receive. <laughs> Tell us. And uh, appa apparently you love squash. Uh, we won't hold that against you. Uh, <laughs> praise Jesus. Uh, but I'd love to call up uh, uh, TK. Uh, but again, you guys call him Kajiso. Please, please let's respect him. Uh, let's give him a rooted <laughs> fellowship. Welcome. Welcome, my brother. Thank you. Do you need this? No, 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 I should know myself by now. <laughs> great, 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 great. All right, so, um, so we, jumped, we jumped on a call this week, all right, face-to-face uh, -face via Zoom, but like I said, because of COVID, uh, if we meet on Zoom, it means we've met in person. And, uh, and we were chatting a little bit about what today would entail and uh, what we've been through last week and, and where we want to go as a church. But it was quite interesting, uh, and before we jump into all the, the questions, um, right off the bat, uh, you, you mentioned the fact that, you know, oftentimes we read the scriptures, and, and when we read people and individuals, we tend to think first uh, priest or, or, or some spiritual leadership role, and you were like, no, 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 but, but there were a ton of people who operated in everyday life, uh, which is where you guys find yourselves, um, in, in economic spaces, uh, in the uh, education space, and in government. 
Uh, and I said this as well last week when I said, um, you know, we, we look to the likes of uh, David or Joseph or Nehemiah, uh, who are just incredible human beings, but also were like, you know what, I, I find myself in the kind of government space, and so what is my role as a Christian? And, uh, and this is when I knew that you and I are going to be very, very close friends. Um, you, you went to Moses, right? You, you brought up Moses. And uh, we uh, walked through the book of Exodus uh, about two years ago, and uh, it's just so, so incredibly powerful. And uh, the book of Exodus is, is slowly becoming my favorite book in the, the Bible. Uh, if you guys know me, I talk about Ephesians a lot, and, and Hebrews was incredible. But Exodus is powerful, and, and that's where we see the life of Moses. But, but maybe by way of introduction, uh, talk to us a little bit about what you said to me about how you see Moses and, and maybe how we should see Moses uh, as we think about this year, as we think about elections and, and the political space and government. All right. No, uh, good morning to everyone, and uh, again, thanks for having me. Just a side, a side one. Uh, I did ask that you don't have to read everything. Uh, reason being is, uh, look, at the end of the day, look, we, we're blessed to do different things in our different lives. I, I just so happened to be there. But I was like, okay, look, it's good he's reading it. But I was just sad that I did say I was going to bring my family along. Uh, so the wife is a medical doctor. She's on call. And then I had my son. So we had this thing. My son doesn't believe I work. Because of COVID, I've always been at home when he was born. So he always says, Mama, I'm 70, Mama, I'm 70. And I'm like, when are, where are you going? He was like, 70, meaning school. So I said, what does Papa do? Papa, I'm 70. Like, apparently I work for him, so I don't have a real life job. So I was like, maybe today was the day he's actually going to see me do work, what I actually do in real life. But just uh, so thank you for the invite. Uh, look, the reason I went to Moses is when you read what specifically Moses and Daniel are, it's what I think most of us are, which in the sense that Moses did not have what we term the, the traditional priesthood. Moses, for all parts and purposes, was born into a royal family. Moses went to, at that time, the greatest empire. He went through that education system. So in, if you know anything about kings and priests and princesses, is their whole education is leadership and leading. You might not be the king, but he was going to get the designate of probably being a prime minister to the king. So that's what Moses was trained to do. Now, you kind of see how Moses in God's plan works out when he has to now lead. God could have picked anyone, by the way. Uh, if you really do read the book of Exodus further on, we know about Aaron, right? But what we missed is who set up Aaron's priesthood? It was Moses. And Moses, to such a point I was reading Exodus, I'm like, if I'm Aaron, I'm thinking, yo, you really are not a great older brother. You... I, First, I have to put on all these weird garments. I have to do all this work. And when are you just, you're just doing that, telling me what to do? Uh, but then if you look at the way he, there's a, there was, used to be this thing on DSTV, the History Channel, where they actually looked at Moses not as a biblical figure, but as a general. Because one of the things you're taught in, uh, I think in Botswana they know it quite well, in the military, and especially for royalty, is military, military service and military. So when you look at how Moses led them out, you would have seen that there was a light at the back. So they had a military person simply read the Bible and say, tell us about Moses. And he's saying, no, look, the way he led people is how I would lead my regiment in war. Uh, the way he was feigning, going to and fro, that's what we teach our military people, that if you're under attack, that's how you go. And also then the way he obviously, with the help of his uh, father-in-law, said, look, this is how you set up. This is how you set up our battle. This is how we're going forward. So no way in there is it saying Moses is a priest on a Sunday. Everything is saying is Moses is an active participant. Moses is a president. Moses is a king, them-minded individual. So that's it. Wow. How I look at my life is, look, I'm not less because I'm not a... While I give all intents and purposes, I think we respect our pastors, respect our priests... I'm not less than, mm. it's where God has me exactly. Mm. And that's the same thing with Daniel. Daniel was an advisor at the end of the day. As again, God can always pick anyone for every situation, but if you look at what the patriarchs are, Abraham, for all intents and purposes, was an entrepreneur. Mm. So that's how I kind of understood and said, oh, wow. So the job I'm doing and the job of at the end of the day of every Christian is to be impactful in all the industry. Mm. But Moses stands out because even Jesus references Moses. Wow. Uh, there's a guy who says, look, the popular kid at the time for all Israelites or Jews is always Moses. Mm. 
And how we view Moses compared to how they view him is very different. Moses is everything we think Jesus is in the sense that he's part of their savior story, of course. But most important, he's the leader. He's a leader in industry. And if you know anything about Jewish people, they do well the world over. Brilliant. So good. So good. I, I, I just knew we we're going to be very close because of that. Um, so let's, maybe let's dive in. Look, we're talking uh, politics. We're talking governments and election year. Um, so maybe... Uh, could you paint a picture of, uh, of, of the, the, the different political parties? And I know, I mean, we spoke about how uh, the difference between Botswana and uh, or even the US and South Africa is that what, what, there are so many political parties here. And so I know we don't have time to go through all of them, um, but I think it's helpful to know uh, a little bit, just give us you know, broad strokes of the major political parties. Because uh, I, I think, and, and this is me, uh, oftentimes I find myself uh, believing something about a political party because of the uh, maybe the leader of that political party or what uh, I've seen on, on Instagram or, or on YouTube or speech that they made. And I go, you know what, because that person said X, Y, Z, that's the political party. But, but maybe could you give us some, some just broad strokes of uh, the major parties and, and, and what they're about and, and maybe help us think through uh, how we are to maybe understand them a little bit better. No. Okay. No, I'll just start with this broad framework that I'm sure you guys are going to hear this a lot on the television. So it's 2024 is special because half of the world's democracies are voting. Right now, obviously, when you put India there, it's already half. So we don't really have to worry population-wise, but th that's the big thing. Look, how would I look at South African? I look at it from this side, right? There's a spectrum of, when we say left and right, and you always have to be clear on this in South Africa, because when you say left in America and you say right in South Africa, you're talking two different things. So in South Africa, right, what we traditionally mean is far right would be Freedom Front Plus, right? Far left would be the economic freedom fighters. Far left, left, right, I always get it wrong. I should know this, I'm driving. Yeah, so we'll, we'll do it like that. In the middle, traditionally, has always been the African National Congress. I think we all know that, right? And then you have splatters of the ACDP tends to, for all intents and purposes, we tend to shift them as center right, center of the ANC going right, right? And by that we mean, when we mean right in South Africa, what people normally mean is, are you or for you, are you for or against black economic empowerment? So that kind of shifts you in a different way, that's one category. Two, which is becoming more, and I'm sure if you're a parent you know more about it, male, female, homosexuality. So the more you tend not to believe in that, the more they put you far right. Now, what's always made the ANC unique is everything I've told you, I'm speaking about individual parties, right? In Qatar Freedom Party tends to be center right again of the ANC. What tends to be center left of the ANC it becomes a bit skewed. There's always been a gap. And that's where the ANC traditionally has what's termed as alliance partners, right? They're not political parties as such. Kosatu, uh, the South African Communist Party. And then there's this huge system. There's other parties which I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on because they don't quite register, but the PAC also tends to be the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, so that's how it tends to go. What's made the ANC unique is everything I've said, I'm speaking about individual parties. All of the spectrum of left, right, hmm. is all within the ANC. Hmm. Within the ANC, you can find what's termed hardcore Christians, you can find hardcore leftists and atheists, and that's what's always made the ANC a bit of an oddity. Now, we have new parties, which I term their, look, it's parties which I would say the post-1994 parties, right? You've, I'm not gonna go over COPE, I'm sure your parents would have gone through the COPE experience, but uh, type of thing. So where we are at the moment is you have parties like Rizam Zanti, I'm sure you've heard them. Where would I put Rizam Zanti? Rizam Zanti is like an ANC light, and that's how they've also kind of characterized themselves, which is center, right? The ANC has become a bit center left more than they used to be central, but. That's where Rizam Zanti is. Bossa, I think he's also a pastor, Musi, my money, but he goes by Musi. He also tends to be center, is it center? A bit of center left, uh, and you tend to see that's where the spectrum of most South African voters also is. The weird, the weird thing when I was doing research about this, I was saying, look, if I'm speaking to a, a Christian audience, I have to say, okay, TK, outside of the ACDP, which every Christian for some reason gets thrown into that uh, realm of ACDP, which is weird because most South African Christians actually don't vote ACDP. Mm. I'm not saying it's wrong or right, that's for you to judge. Interesting. But it, it tends to be, 
the oddity that, I, so I opened up the Freedom Front classes website and their policies. It's one of the few parties outside the SADP that says, look, these, we are the first value they say, we are a Christian-based party. For you to believe in us, this is what we believe. I've got a colleague who is, who's melanin. I always get, get confused about my melanin. Is it more or less? I'm not sure. Who, he says that TK is a Christian guy. He's in one of the elders at our church. He says, TK, if we had to be realistic and in line with our Christian values, he likes stirring me. He says, you know, I really don't think it's a far-fetched idea to be supporting the Freedom Front Plus. And he just leaves it there. And I'm also just going to leave it there. <laughs> so those are the political parties and the spectrums of how it works in South Africa. We are not like, and I'm glad that you mentioned America, we're not like America where it's two tiers, right? Republicans and Democrats. And the traditional notion used to be Republicans are center right and the de Democrats are center left. It's changed a bit. And uh, I always say, look, while I like that the Republicans are, it's normal for a Republican to say, you know, I believe in God. Sometimes it used to be the same for Democrats. But I always think South Africans, we're not there. We're a bit more accommodating of your difference. We can understand that you're a Christian and you're ANC. We can even understand that you're a Christian and you're EFF. So we tend to be more concentrated on our histories. Now, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Or maybe Christians in South Africa have not really... I would say anything that the church, and this is my personal view and I can be... Challenged. It's totally I, fine. We'll just edit yeah, this out yeah. of the of the recording. <laughs> so, no, I, I would say the confusion for a lot of Christians has always been the question of our history. Mm. If you read the first three or four, five presidents of the ANC were all pastors. Mm. The ANC was born out of that mm. history. So when you speak to your parents or your grandparents, that's what makes it confusing for them. Because when you and I think A and C, because we are a post-90 thing, we think services and other things. Wow. For their history, it's no, man. Some of these people are people I went to church with. Some of these guys are as being a church-like person, right? The, one of the greatest A and C presidents, Or Tambo, read on his history. Firm believer. Mm. It, to such a point that if you speak to A and C people, they'll tell you. If there was no OR Tambo, the ANC would not have existed. Wow. He just basically held them together. Now, the confusion then becomes from, let's say, our brethren, uh, white South Africans, is it's the same thing with them with the National Party. Hmm. Heavily invested, the Dutch Reformed Church. So, what makes South Africa weird, and the reason maybe I think Christians find it hard, is we tend to have an attitude that says, owing to our history, when we get to politics, let's part Jesus a bit so that we can find each other. Mm. Is it right or is it wrong? Uh, you, you kind of need to come up with it. I just simply think that it's a bit, you can't live in two different worlds and it's seemingly coming to an edge now yeah. where if you speak to most people in church, there's two attitudes. Hey, I, you know, I, politic boss, keep it, keep it there. Mm -hmm. Now I'm about, I'm about the rent and the sense at the moment. Or B, oh yeah, I'm fully for it, I'm fully for it, but I'm not quite sure what Jesus feels about me voting. Mm. Yeah, so I just, that's the spectrum of South African politics. Wow, so good. I mean, <clears throat> I was hoping you were going to say, uh, and on that note, you should vote for this political party, uh, but you didn't go there, you just made it uh, even more confusing for us uh, as we kind of make our way uh, towards uh, uh, voting day. But maybe, because you didn't say that, uh, and I think it's right, um, we should wrestle with this. We should uh, seek uh, counsel and wisdom from God uh, on where we are to go as Christians. Uh, but maybe, uh, again, paint a picture for us, broad strokes. Um, uh, major parties, let's talk about those who could potentially win um, and become kind of the, uh, the leader of uh, this country. Uh, what... What are the outcomes of that? Like, what, what, what should we, and I know that you are not coming here as a prophet, but please don't, don't hear this as him saying, thus says the Lord, don't, please, please. Some of you guys will come post election day and be like, but only you said, no, no, no. But, um, but maybe walk us through what we should expect. Because I think it's important for us to be somewhat prepared for what's coming. And so uh, what should we expect if certain parties when? Okay. No, uh, that's, a, that's a good What should we expect? All right, I'll just do this uh, simple exercise. 
I just want those of you who've got phones which are said to be smart, if we could just take them out quickly. Smartphones. <laughs> what, right. he, what, he, what he's saying is iPhones. <laughs> if you have an iPhone. No, I, if, you, I if you have an Android, just keep it in your, in your pocket or your handbag, it's, uh, and we'll continue to pray for you. All right. I'll, I'll ask a show of hands, right, two or three, because I, I want to kind of show you. While I, I'm not a prophet, and I don't want to be cast as a false prophet, what I do in my professional life is I'm a scenario planner, which is companies ask you, and this is a funny thing, even private sector companies are asking the question, which way is it going? Mm -hmm. Where are we going? So I'm just going to ask you two, two questions, show of hands. Based on your smartphone, how many of you guys know who your local counselor is? You, please, please feel free to look around. Your local counselor. Okay, that's one. So we'd say what, less than? Uh, let's, let's say it as it is, 10%? Less, less, less than 10%. How many of you guys know your, while we don't, like in Botswana, have a constituency-based system, we do have a local MP assigned to a area. How many of you guys know your local MP, or even member of provincial legislature? Okay, wow, okay, okay. 0. 0.000, so we're good, okay. <laughs> All right. The reason I wanted to start in that way is you're not unique, by the way. I do this with CEOs and everybody else. It's the same thing. Supposedly, CEOs are like present. They're supposed to be all-knowing. But this tends to happen a lot of times. And you're asking me now where we're going is this is almost like a representation of what's likely to happen in South Africa. Right? Mm -hmm. The certainty was always that, ah, look, the ANC wins. Right? And I'm sure you guys have heard it. Now, I take a bit of a different stance in the sense that having come from the Val, the Val is, for all instincts and purposes, yeah, it's a failed, it's a failing, it's a failed city, in a, it's a failed uh, area, it's home. I like it anyway, right? But I tend to find that when I have this discussion with people who are more, what's a, that's a nice way to put it, uh, it's a Sunday, so I, my wife always says I must be more politically correct on a Sunday. <laughs> Let's say the LSM is a bit different. Let's say areas which are more poverty stricken, I ask the same thing, they tend to know who their counselor is. And guess what? They tend to vote along who their counselor is, right? I'm taking it the long way because I want to show you what's most likely to happen is we've got a disengaged, disengaged, not that most of you guys care about politics. It's just that I'm very sure you're not the type who's going to be toy toy tomorrow or the next day or the next day, right? What we tend to find is that there are certain things which are certain. The ANC will, has a solid 40%. They can do anything. That's 40% is a given. So that, that, let's just start by this. So the question they then asked is to say, now I'm going to come to this room, and the reason I was asking the question, out of this room, how do we get to 50? We've seen in the city of Tswane, City of Joe, well, basically all the metros, right? Uh, the ANC has dipped. Okay, I'm being kind. Yeah, no, they've crashed, or they are crashing. But this is the weirdest thing. Metros are not only made by suburbs. <laughs> They're made by townships. Sure. Right? So that, as I said, the reason I'm going back to the same question I asked, do you know, do you know? I can kind of say that, look, we're looking at two or three sets of scenarios. The ANC, because I said 40 is, is a given. Those people that have imaginations or dreams that the ANC is just going to disappear from existence, not happening. That 40% is rock solid. By the way, I always give this story. My parents are part of that 40%. That's why they were so eager when I got married, because they're like, finally, we can kick you out of our house, because you're not part of the 40%. And, they're always, <laughs> and it's the weirdest thing. My father is an entrepreneur. My mother was a teacher. She's retired. From Year one to year five, no, no, year four and a half. My father complains, complains, business is not going right, they're not giving us services. Year five, he becomes very different. He would literally say, tell my brother, what uh, varsity, look, we're fetching you over the voting weekend. Why? My brother's like, why? Why? We don't trust you, and you need to come vote for the ANC at home. And we're like, but pa, you've been, for four and a half years, you've been crying about this one party. But hey, 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 this nonsense of yours, these English schools, stop. The nonsense stops here. Come vote. I'm just trying to show you how embedded, that's, when I say 40%, you guys all have parents or grandparents. You know you're not moving them from there, right? Mm. 
so let's say the, so when I, where I see the ANC going because of this rock for is they're just simply fighting to say can we at least get to 50 let's say 48 51 that's what the ANC is fighting for right and let's say the worst case they get 48 well 48 just basically means they do a city of Joburg El Jama come through give us votes ex party come through meaning sure. we will give you a ministry which no one cares about sports arts and culture but you still get a salary of a minister, and you still get a blue light. And the thing which we always miss about politics, and the Bible kind of speaks it, is ego is very big. Mm. You guys have no idea, having worked, Seppo knows, having worked with politicians, ego stroking. Oh my, you have, men or women, by the way, it doesn't matter. Mm. It doesn't matter, it goes in that way, right? But now, let's say the NC crashes at 45, right? There's an, this room is not moving. Well, it now presents an interesting set of scenario. The one thing you need to know about the ANC, the ANC is power. And the ANC, the principles are quite simple, power. Meaning, and you guys have heard the story, the EFF, which is around 12%, and I always make this disclaimer with the EFF, don't believe EFF on social media. If the elections were on social media, the EFF would be governing us now every day. Because in most instances, black and white South Africans are not extremists. There's a reason why the ANC, at its peak, could hit 67, right? I think 67 yeah. over 65, two-thirds in parliament. Is at the end of the day, most South Africans are actually quite centrist. We want to know business works. We want to know, we, we accept that the state has a role to play, right? Th that's most South African. So while the EFF shouts, what I tend to find speaking to corporate, especially corporate black South Africans is, we like the EFF because the EFF scares the boss. Because mm. if EFF will make sure that, hey, racy racism, no, no, not happening now. But would I vote? No, 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 no. I, I like my comfort of living in Santin, and I don't want my interests and my unit trust to be affected. So you only bring in the EFF to scare someone, not to govern, right? Now, the EFF is being very smart in that they could give the ANC, let's look, the, the EFF is going to get above 10%. You have to just... The question we're asking when we're looking at, not polls, but speaking is, is it 12 going to 18, or is it 12 going to 15? Either way, it's something they can negotiate with the ANC, mm. right, which brings them above 50. But the EFF is very, in economics, rent-seeking. They will extract a heavy value. Mm. You will give us the Ministry of Finance. Those that work in the markets will already know this exchange the next day will be doing all sorts of stuff. You thought living with President Jacob Zuma was an up and down experience. Imagine Minister of Finance, Julius Malema. <laughs> yeah, but look, th they are very sound in what they want, mm. right? It's, uh, the FF, people kind of always miscrew what they want. The FF actually doesn't care. What the FF wants, and if you look at the city of Tswane, you don't have to believe me, just look up the deal called Glad Africa. Right, what happened with Latin Africa is rent seeking. You need to give something a bit to allow this to happen. Now, the reason I'm going to the Democratic Alliance last is the DA is a bit weird. DA, and I, look, we, no one can deny if you go to the Western Cape, it is beautiful. Let's not lie and come here and say, oh no. No, 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 look, I'm sure when you're visiting the Western Cape, you're not going to Google it to stay. Let's just be very honest. If you've got family there, they'll tell you a different story. I've been to Google Air too, and look, certain of the hardcore infrastructure in Google Air, you can say, mm, wow, this is better than certain townships in here in Gauteng. Mm. It works, right? What they're struggling with is to say, why aren't South Africans buying our model? Right, and let's be very clear what they mean, which South Africans? Mm. And uh, thing, when you speak to them, and this is the weirdest thing, I've spoken to some of the strategists, the DA will tell you, up front, the strategist, okay, behind the doors, he'll say, TK, you know what, I, had, I remember having one two years ago, he was like, TK, in reality, we as a DA know we're overshooting. Because they say this is a demographic of a South African. Most South Africans are Christian. Most South Africans are conservative, social conservative. Most South Africans want the market. What most, uh, so in short, he was saying, we know the ACDP should be scoring higher. But what the ACCPDP doesn't do is speak about the economy, and this is where we come in. But now they've sort of shot themselves a bit in the foot in the sense that they are stuck between 18, 18, right? 18, 19 percent. 
And there's a high, I always say there's a higher likelihood that the EFF might catch up with them than them getting South Africa or running South Africa. Hmm. And that's simply because, like even the EFF, they know that South Africans kind of come in the center, black and white, by the way. There's no, very few South Africans, let's not lie, very few South Africans say, listen, we're going to be a monoculture. As in, it's going to be, as in, black nationalists forever, no. White, no, no. We're, the numbers and the economy just doesn't allow for that to happen. So between the EFF and the DA, they, they, it's almost like they're stuck in the teens. Mm. And the question is, out of these two parties, who's most likely, who's the ANC most likely to get along with? And it's not a far-fetched rumor to believe that, hey, to get that 10%, in, let's say they get 45%, and they really do need to get it over, the smaller parties aren't coming to the table. It's not unheard of, and if you speak to ANC people, they're like, ah, you know, the DA, ah, look, at least we know they'll keep an eye on us. We won't be stealing as rapidly as we used to. <laughs> I can live with that. It's, so that's where, yeah. if you're saying who's the ANC going to look like, if, who are they going to look for, if they wanted to overshoot into the 50, they, I'd say there's a higher probability, and those that do maths know what I mean by probability, it's the zeros and everything else, that they might go for a DA. Mm. Two is more stable than a multiple coalition of Al Jama, who knows who else they're going to bring along, right? Yeah. And it makes more sense. And also, historically, the commander in chief, for all he's done, kind of rub rubs off certain ANC elders in the wrong way. So there are those that are like, ah, no, Gauteng, different case altogether. The ANC accepts Gauteng is gone, Gauteng is going to be a coalition. Uh, oh. Panyaza with Ama Panyaza is. It's not working. But then I was also wanted because I want to do quickly by province by province. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I always make this joke when speaking to people, saying, people in their minds, when you guys think Democratic Alliance and Western Cape, you think it's rock solid, right? No, the the DA has actually been declining in the Western Cape. It's actually a 55 declining. And there's a guy who's come on the scene now. If you're saying somebody, if we're looking for somebody who says the name Jesus. Gator McKenzie says Jesus a lot. Now, I'm not here to, it's him. You guys will sort it out. It's you and God will sort out where you and Gator stand with it. But it's, so there's a high chance that, look, the DA will continue declining in the Western Cape. And Gator McKenzie literally is on the rise. Now, even DA guys will say, look, worst case, same thing with South Africa, with the ANC. The DA is actually, can picture themselves saying, mm, you know what, we can take a hit, but only at 48. Because basically, we've got a history, even in the city of Cape Town, of going to smaller parties and saying, guys, hey, let's just keep the, let's make sure we don't become like the rest of South Africa. Eastern Cape, look, uh, went to Eastern Cape two years ago, I was speaking to a guy in a taxi, he was like, I'm like, you guys are like in a battered, it's just like, you know, it's not me, it's battered wife syndrome, that's what they call it, or Stockholm syndrome. You're in an abusive relationship with this party, you're staying, for all intents and purposes, Eastern Cape is a failed province. Mm. It's not me saying it, the numbers tell you that. So I asked, why do you guys vote the same party? And he's like, Chief, eh, you don't understand. This is home for us. This party is home. You're not moving them, right? The worst case the NC will do there is like, what, get 51, 52, 53. But there's no opposition in the Eastern Cape. To such a point, the DA undercover makes a, they make the argument that We'd rather take the Northern Cape and take the Eastern Cape. No one wants to touch the Eastern Cape. That's how bad it is. So they'll go, they're like, yeah, yeah vote for us. They're like, no, 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 keep it, keep it the ANC. It's a good example of failure. We like it like that wow. type of thing. Wow. Northern Cape, ANC, there's really not much of an opposition. KZN is interesting. And you, you guys kind of know where I'm going with KZN. There's a certain former president <laughs> who, and this is the weirdest thing. I don't like polls in South Africa because we're not really a poll country. The one thing I tell you to look out for is most of the polls in South Africa tend to be sponsored by lobby groups. When you hear Brenthurst, it's very attached to the Oppenheimer family. Nothing wrong with the Oppenheimer family. If you've got that type of wealth, why must I hate? I'd like to also have it. It's just, why must I hate? I just want to say, uh, <laughs> if you have that kind of wealth, we are in a two-year uh, <laughs> journey on generosity and uh, just, that's, that's, they know, but carry on, carry on. Yeah, look, and it makes sense for them as well, right? South Africa, I think we are the 39th largest economy. 
I think what, what's our USD value? 405.2557 US, uh, billion US dollars. In truth, South Africa is supposed to be higher than 39 because the two African countries ahead of us is Egypt and Nigeria. I would argue where South Africa is, we're actually supposed to be either top 15, worst case top 15, top 20. Because mm. when you go to other parts of the world, South Africa, we have, not great, we still need a lot of industrialization, but South Africa's financial services are world class. Yeah. Uh, lived in Germany, Germany cash is still king. Now there's a psychology about it, because Germans believe and psychology tells you when you take out physical money, it hurts you more. Like there's a little ping, as opposed to just tapping, tapping, tapping. So the Germans kind of know their story, but the point is to say, tapping in Germany, certain restaurants, uh, what? They just look at you and say, what? And you're like, I want to tap apple. They just look at you, nah, nah, this type of thing. So we are literally underperforming as a country, right? So what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to get to is, you now get to KZN, and there's a guy and the reason I said look out for posts is for all his sins, for lack of a better word, people love the guy. Even your parents, and you all know this to be true. Mm. Some of your own parents like the guy. He, my father says, you know, his only thing was he wasn't great at managing the economy. I'm like, well, that's what a president is supposed to do. <laughs> you know? Like, you're great at doing everything else, but you can't manage the economy. Right? But the point is to say, and I can say this as somebody who's married from someone from KZN, so there's no other issues I can say is, look, he plays the victim card very well. And uh, one thing I know about that province is they love an underdog story. Mm. That's why KZN is unique in Southern, that, like the Western Cape, they really don't have much loyalty to a political party. The reason the ANC did well in KZN historically was because of a lot of traditional IFP voters went with JZ. Uh, undercover, it was also an issue of saying it's our turn to rule. Right? This party doesn't need to get, and this is a mistake people make, the MK party, if you've never heard of it, tomorrow I think there's a judgment coming out whether they can use the name or not, but that's besides the point. They don't need to get 50% of our votes. The two largest voting blocks in South Africa is Gauteng and KZN by virtue of population and the age. If he and his party were to get 10% of KZN, there are some people who are saying they could even shoot to 15%, which basically knocks the IFP, knocks the DA, and other parties. He literally, if you're asking him in coalitions, and I can, he can literally say, I've got you, what can you give me? Hmm. And remember, because of that corridor that exists between KZN and Gauteng, he only needs like 5% in Gauteng. In Pumalanga as well, he's also gunning for that as well. It's a stronghold of the ANC, they're not gonna lose it. But if you only get 5%, remember, you, it's not that you're not negotiating with a province, you're negotiating with a national thing. If you're mm. the ANC, you, you're at 40, let's say 45%, JZ literally can give you 50. What will you not do to allow him to, to get power again? Um. He cannot be president again, he's made peace with that. But I can tell you the one thing he's gonna ask for is get rid of your number one president. Because the one thing about JZ, he never forgets people who've wronged him, hmm. type of thing. So KZN is going, look, it's going to go either that way. Or it could also be a situation where the IFP continues this trend of doing well. The IFP, and I'm not saying this is a bad thing, I haven't lived there, the IFP doesn't really care about the rest of South Africa. The IFP's mantra is give us back our province. And if the ANC were to say, look, we need X amount to get back to national, the IFP can will literally say, we don't care about a ministry, you can keep that. Give us back our province and we'll give you a national. That's it, that's what they care about. Mm. And if I'm them as well, I would also take the same thing of, why must I sully my name when the ANC is gonna mess up nationally? Let me take, let me do a Western Cape with the KZN. Fix the province, say, look guys, I'm also ready to govern and move forward. So that's KZN, look, other provinces, Mpumalanga we know, Limpopo we know, it's ANC. Free state, it will eventually be ANC, but obviously they'll take a bit of a dent. Northwest, oh, a poor province, it's always suffering. Look, the EFF is the only opposition in town. The ANC will still keep it because there's more people that still historically vote ANC than vote any other party. So the 
three provinces we're really looking at is Western Cape, KZN, and Gauteng. Hmm. Those are the ones that likely I'm going to play around with. Change could happen there. Western Cape, I doubt will be, look, it will be the DA plus another partner if things go horribly wrong for them. KZN is the one where, look, it's a bit up in arms, we don't know. Gauteng is a given. We are, you're going to have a coalition government here. And this is where I guess maybe the question comes in, where do Christians stand on this? Yeah. I, yeah, I've got my own beliefs and views, yeah. uh, but I would like to think this is a part of the reason we're in this quagmire is I'll make the argument that church and Christians have not played an active role in, in politics. Mm. And I, listen to what I said, politics, not party politics. Because I, I fully understand that some are called. Look, uh, you have been called uh, to do ministry. Some people have been called to the market to work for JC listed companies. Some people have been called to be entrepreneurs. But what I tend to find, and going back to the reason I raised my hand, is when you ask Christians and when you read the Bible, the Bible for me is very clear. You need to be city salt. You need to be active. I'm not saying you must be president. I'm not saying you must be the commander in chief. But I always ask this question of Christians to say, when you read the word, when you really go for it, 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 they really, you, you cannot go to the voting booth and say, Jesus, I don't know. Because sure. Jesus only is going to be, well, what, because Jesus is very much about performance based. What did you do historically in us getting to this point? Mm. Right? Maybe some of you guys are meant to be in politics. Because we have new legislation, which oddly enough was brought by a Christian organization, uh, which says you don't even have to run under a banner of a party anymore. You can run as an individual. That legislation, whether I agree or disagree with it, was actually brought by a few guys I know who are Christians who actually took it all the way to the Constitutional Court hmm. and said, look, as an individual, as a citizen, I should have a right to represent myself at the legislature and at the National Assembly without having to go through a political party. Now, they were Christians, Sunday guys and women just like you and I, and they said, look, this is our contribution to the polity, because that's what politics is, the polity of South African politics. So now the question is almost like the ball is in your court. Mm. Yeah. I want to I wanna double kick on that, um, because, uh, and that was amazing. Thank you for that just overview of just the country um, and the different provinces. But, but we do live in Gauteng. Uh, that is our reality. Um, and uh, you mentioned uh, uh, quite possibly a coalition reality. Um, so maybe my question is, let's, let's drill down, let's get to the nitty gritties. Um, what, is, what, what is our involvement at, at, a, at, a, at a local level, right? So we, yes, we're voting for, for national, the whole country, but, uh, and then when that happens, you know, whoever wins, wins, and uh, God is sovereign over all of that. Um, but then Monday comes, and Tuesday comes, and, and Wednesday comes, and, and so what is, what is our involvement at a local level? Uh, there's some folks here that get the privilege and, uh, to go to uh, Cape Town and to engage in the halls of government and, and some here in uh, the great city of Pretoria that are uh, navigating through all of that in government space. But, but for the everyday person, what is, what is our involvement? And, and maybe you could, you know, in that, talk to us a little bit about local versus national. Like what, what are the different spheres of government and because um, some folks might know, no, they don't know that. Like, they just think, I'm going to go vote for someone to lead the country, um, but what are the implications of that in my neighborhood? So, so, so what is our involvement locally? Uh, I'll start with the spheres, right? Uh, look, the wording is very specific, if you read the Constitution and even academically. We call it spheres of government for a reason. We have your national, and obviously what people see every February, is men and women who go to parliament and play around. That is national, right? And the, there's a second chamber called the NSOP, the NCOP, National Chambers. It's like the second chamber of parliament, right? And then obviously there's, there's the local. Uh, we had, that's why we're here as Twane. <laughs> uh, I live in Twane as well. This is where we find ourselves, right? And the argument has always been that, listen, the reason we have local government is that you're supposed to kind of know, that's why I ask, do you know your councillor, right? But I think the problem has always been, and this is not just us as a Christian, it's a South Africa thing, is 
we kind of have always lent on the idea that, no, this person is from the DA, I know them, the DA is fine, they'll do the job. And we just leave it to the political parties. You, the agreement is, I vote, you deliver. But we've kind of seen that agreement is not working. Mm -hmm. And I think this was always bound to happen. Because uh, if you read a lot of the history of South Africa is, when South Africa works and works well, citizens are very engaged. Right? I'm sure you guys have heard of this thing called, what was in the 90s, uh, not the NF, it was the, I always keep forgetting the name, but people like Minister Godan used to be on it, right? UDF, right? United Democratic Front. It was almost like the substitute for when the ANC wasn't, was banned and the PAC was banned. But what it used to do is go to communities and say, listen, guys, keep active, know what's happening. But I just want to bring it to 2024. When, the reason I started with the hand thing is to say, South Africans, and I, and I say this with the kindest heart that I've only got, I think, one or two passports, so I can say this. South Africans, I think, are some of the most spoiled individuals in the world. Mm. No, no, it is. Uh, when I was living in Australia, the, re the reason Australia, uh, Australians have this attitude, this is what they say. They say, it's compulsory to vote in Australia, one. So, so I used to think, yo, why would you guys want compulsory? They say, TK, when you vote, whether it's even if you go spoil the ballot and you don't care, at least you're kind of saying, listen, I care about what's happening. I'm alive to the situation. South Africans have got a larger mentality of, oh, well, you know, and I'll be very honest, it's, it's the middle class who say, well, you know, the road's not working, we'll get something to someone to come fix it. Well, ESCOM is failing, we'll get solar. Well, you know what, hey, public school doesn't work, I will go to Crawford. Oh, now what's the in one? It's Curo, right? Yeah, Curo is the new one. My generation was Crawford type of thing. And, and then the ones who really have money, you know, like St. John's. Uh, I'm a St. John's guy, so I can't really say much. <laughs> when you really, so that's where we, so we always have alternatives, right? But here's the situation, and I wanna just paint this picture with you very quickly. You are an individual who has done everything, this, the South African story, right? You have, you've passed matric, which we all know is not a mean feat. And I'm sure if you guys who got kids, I don't know how they're passing now because hey, the stuff they're learning is, we, some of us, I'm like, oh, homework. I'll just have to hire a tutor type of thing. You've passed matric, you, and we have to say, you're blessed to be able to get into a varsity. Obviously, my employer is VITS, so I have to say, you go to, you go to the best university in South Africa, you go to VITS type of thing. Well, you get into VITS. We'll edit that as well, <laughs> so it's uh, University of Pretoria. You go to VITS, and then we have this problem, which is now when you're really blessed, you get a job. Right? So your life is clicking along. Yeah, you know, I've got that. You get your VW, yeah. You know, you're clicking all the things. VW, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. And then you tend to find that things stop you, right? And that's why I want to stop. You kind of forget that's not the history of South African politics. Roll back 40 years. Some of you guys were not going to be allowed to be doing a lot of those things, right? And the reason why I say South Africa for all is we don't want that to be a barrier for everyone, black or white. You should be able with your God-given abilities to literally enjoy the ladder of going whatever that is. Now, where I say South Africans are lazy is, remember I said we're the 39th economy, we actually, for some odd reason, considered an upper middle class country. When I go home to the Val, Everton to be more specific, that does not look upper middle class. <laughs> Right? So, it's, and the thing is, people literally become fooled to believe that by virtue of you having the ability to live in a state, you can escape South Africa. Mm. The reason I said the private sector is also now starting to think is, because years back, the private sector used to say, we can literally absorb the mistakes of the ANC. We, we, we're big enough, right? We, we're gonna go to the continent. Uh, I'm allowed to say, A.B. Abenath Hauser, uh, S.A.B because they've got the international name, right? SAB, Nedbank, uh, Stan, Standard Bank in Lesotho, Stanpik, right? They literally were like, we can afford to live through the ANC's thing. I'm not sure how many of you guys work in the private sector. How many, how many of you guys have seen a lot of South African private sector companies run back home to South Africa, right? They did a project for one of these property, I can't explain which firm it was, but they were like, Africa's tough. <laughs> That's what they say, Africa is tough. And the reason being, South Africa has a lot of luxuries. 
And I think Christians have also started to do the same thing. And let's be very honest, it's a particular type of Christian. Mm. I'm not calling people out, I'm just saying. Like, no, nah, I can literally be, go through the ladders, live in my estate, the ANC will not touch me. Or government will not touch me. Uh, I'm not sure when last you looked at our indicators or when you were driving through what's happening is all of us have got family. You might, they might not be as privileged as you are, but I can guarantee you they've been touched by unemployment. And if you're a woman in this, I'm not even, we know the story. We're not going to go there, right? Mm. And, it's, and that sometimes I think we believe it's a normal thing in South Africa. It's only sometimes when you leave South Africa you learn that this is highly abnormal. This is a very abnormal country. So saying, where do Christians go to? I always say four things as Christians we should care about. Education. Because it doesn't matter, depending on your skill set as an individual, education is still, that, it's still that vehicle that can take everybody out of poverty. You know, some of us are standing here because education. Christ has helped. You have to be excellent. You have to do your part. But education. And then security. Look, if you are a parent of young girls, I must think that is the most, literally plays with your mind. Because you, even with me, my, my wife uh, works in the medical health services. When she has to go out for a call at 11, you're not sleeping. I'm not sleeping. Because one day you want to hear, are you there? Literally, and it's such an abnormal thing, because when you live overseas, safety is the last thing you think about. Like, it literally, it's a, and so I always think safety. Because, again, I always put like this, Females make up 50% of our population, if not higher. Why, as, being selfish as an economic agent, would I want to make their lives harder? Should be making it, because you're literally saying you're, t you're closing off a segment of, po of our population to only walk and live between seven, what, seven in the morning and six. The rest of the time, the female must be at home because of safety. You're literally using, you're losing economic value. Mm. So those are things. So the question you should be asking is, which party speaks about a good education system? As I, I'm not going to tell you where to vote. I'm going to say education. Safety. Now, it could be the safety of the death penalty. That's up to you. I'm, I'm one of those. I'm not anti, because I think if you are brave enough to come into my house, if you're brave enough to involve in rape, uh, you should be brave enough to die. <laughs> but it's a personal belief. All right, so the safety. The economy, right? And when I say the economy, I'm not speaking about you guys want to be entrepreneurs. We should be making space for you guys, right? I'm speaking the ability to say, listen, not every South African is going to be an entrepreneur. Not every South African is going to be a CEO. Not every South African is going to want to go to varsity. But can we work to the gifts that you've been given? Mm. That's it, right? Which says, can you make life easier for people who... Just want because I just my testimony yeah. is, I've been unemployed twice. The first time, I thought I did everything right. I went to the right schools, tick. I went to the right varsity, tick. And then it hits you that no, no phone calls come in. And you're just sitting there, and you're like, but like, have I done something wrong, God? I mean, I was golden key. I did everything you said I must do, and I'm here. And then because I, come, I studied at UKZN, a lot of the guys I studied with have actually mostly all gone to parliament. And you're like, maybe I should have focused on politics <laughs> type of thing. But I'm trying to say is, it doesn't matter who you are, unfortunately. In South Africa, it's become a roll of a dice who gets employed. And you don't think, like the mental anguish you go through, even spiritually, it's, it's crippling. So I always look at who does the economy well. And then look, there's an ability which we kind of forget as South Africans, which is to be a city, right? I mean, to also be a country on a hill. I do care about the region of SEDEC, right? SEDEC being... South Africa, zim, da, da, da. Do you have a vision? Because South Africa cannot be the only rich country. That's why a lot of the parties, you guys would have picked up parties that are going. Uh, one of the labels they're using now is South Africa first. Right? Now, if you've been following international politics, you understand that people, what said local citizens are up in arms about, but wait, why are illegal foreigners getting things in South Africa? I'd rather look at it from this side of saying it's a failure of the state to say, you should have been speaking to Zimbabwe, to say, hey, fix your issues. Your issues are literally affecting us here mm. at home now. Angola, OK, Angola, you don't see a lot of Angolans in South Africa. The ones that come tend to be very well off. Mozambique. Mozambique has got gas for days. 
there was a plan in the 90s between ESCOM and that then apartheid. We were actually supposed to be getting gas from Mozambique, meaning load shedding was not supposed to happen, right? But the point I'm trying to make is that's the four things I always ask for. And then the third of it, the fifth thing, which I always take from uh, the late Pastor Miles Monroe, he says, what, as a political party, what vision have you got for my kids, right? And if you notice, a lot of us South African political parties never speak about the vision they have for our kids. It's uh, nationalized now, okay. We kind of know what happens when you nationalize without compensation. We have a very good example up there. Look, the dynamics of Zim are a bit different. You have to understand Zim's history was, it's, we always say our history is complex. Zim is something, it's a, it's a world unto itself. So it's, I never say it's that simple, but I'm trying to say, do the calculations. Mm. And this is the other thing when you look at manifestos, right? I, I don't read manifestos. The only thing I always look for in manifestos is which political party has calculated how much the manifesto is gonna cost. Mm. Uh, President Trump, I don't know where people sit with him, but remember when he first came on, people said, you're crazy about building the wall. They've got this office in the US. And this is why Trump could say, I'm gonna build a wall. Well, they actually had to calculate, his party had to calculate if we're building a wall across Mexico, how much does it cost? Crazy, not crazy, but at least the point is they calculated. Sure. And uh, this is a weakness I find that if we were active, I'm guaranteed the things I'm asking are what you guys would be ans asking your counselor, right? I, I'm not a, I don't care that you're a fighter. I could really care less. Can you answer these five things for me? Mm. And since you're not doing it, I, why, should I vote, why should I bother with my ex? And I tend to find because we as Christians, have, and I say we, because we, we are we, we've absconded, right? We said somebody will do this. And pastor, the thing is, we're still waiting for someone. That's why, unfortunately, uh, mm. I always say Christians then go to the default position every South African goes to. You know, if Mandela was here, and then I'm like, but wait, you know, the only person we celebrate and and his death is a bit different in that he rose because we're in Easter. Amen. Uh, yeah, so for you as a Christian, if you're saying Mandela, it says to me, all the gifts God has given you, you're telling me you've got nothing to give. Oh. So I think that's where Christians have lost it, where we're comfortable. Mm. And you're saying, what do we do? I'll, that's why I go back. When I say take out your smartphones, I was going to say, go to the IEC website. Log in your, there's a part where it asks you, if you want to know one, where's your voting station? That's national, that's good. Most people know that, that's, not, that's never the debate. But it also gives you who is your local council, and even gives you their number, by the way. I think, I'm not sure because of Poppy, but it gives you their number. Now, my understanding when I read the Bible is that we are supposed to break bread, are we not? What's from stopping you as a Christian from emailing your council and saying, let's break bread. I'm inviting you to supper to my home. Tell me about you. Mm. Why did you get involved in politics? Now, you can go one of two ways. If they reject you, then you know this is how they treat most of the constituents, meaning write that person off. Two, having worked with politicians, they love a free meal, <laughs> one. And two, they like to engage, especially now. I can guarantee if you invite the politicians, they come now. Mm. After the elections, yeah, well, different story, but they'd come now. So I think that's, if I wanna be practical, and yeah. say, I always encourage even people who in the corporate sector say, Invite your counselor now. Yeah. Have the conversation now. And build the conversation. Because a lot of times, uh, we kind of see, I see it from the other way around. These guys are looking for answers, by the way. The majority of politicians, when you sit down with them, are actually very broken people. Literally very broken. They, we always, they're not set apart from us. Some say, listen, I couldn't get employment. This is the easiest way to get a job. Mm. Two, I come from, I didn't have a father figure in my house. So me leading, I, I think I know what I'm doing. Or some are women, because politics is rough to South African women, they tend to be quite extremist feminists. Because if you're in an environment where you're sexually objectified all the time, your natural skin thickness is, I'm going to hate. So you find these broken individuals. Very rarely do they find people who say, Look, listen, even to say, listen, can I just invite you? I just want to pray for the job that you're doing. That doesn't happen. Because they invite them during elections, which I think is wrong, because I think the pulpit is a sacred thing. But they, they don't have people who reach out and say, hey, you know what? I'm a 
specialist in X, can I just speak to you about this policy I have? Because mm. a lot of South African politicians know that they've messed up. It's not a secret to them, by the way. They know this. But what they're missing is, what's that hand extended to me to say, I want to do something different, help me? And my understanding of the church, that's what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. Yeah. So, yeah, that's so that, as practical as you can get, that's wow. advice I always give. Wow, TK. Um, <clears throat> gosh, I wish we had more time. Um, this is so helpful, so, uh, so timely, so necessary. And, uh, and I can just hear your heart um, dripped in uh, the gospel, dripped in the word of God to say, hey, we are navigating through the space. But don't forget that we are Christians. Don't forget that we are children of the kingdom. And, uh, and not only can we actively engage, but we actively engage with tremendous power. Not our power, but power that comes from, from God. And so, I, I, wow, I just, that was super helpful. Those five things, super helpful. We'll find a way to get those to you so you just have them um, and wrestle through them. Uh, maybe in your family groups, uh, as you pray, as you uh, kind of walk towards elections. But I also don't want this to be a moment thing, right? I don't want this to be like, oh, because it's an election year, we're talking about this. Like now everybody's going to be trying to figure out how to actively uh, engage in the political and government arena. No, this is an everyday thing. Everyday thing. Whether it's an election year or not, we should be going, who, who is our council ward? And how can I love what you, how can I break bread? How can I table with them? I, I think it would be incredibly powerful for them to hear from some of you to go, hey, listen, I just want to sit down with you and talk to you about what, what you're hoping and, and dreaming to do here uh, as a citizen. But also I want you to know that, um, that, that God is, is just so loving and so gracious and so merciful. Imagine if your council ward was your one more. What, what kind of impact do you think that that would have? So I, I again, we are pressed for time. So here's what I'm going to do, because we need to close, and uh, some people have a, a roast in the oven um, that they need to get to. I don't know why they would do that on a Sunday, but God bless them. Um, I'm going to call the band up. Uh, we're going to wrap up our time. But maybe if you had one last thing, one you know, final word to say to us, um, what, what would that be? Uh, just to end up what you're saying, we're more empowered than we think. Uh, mm. I think everybody who's have heard, we live in a VUCA world, right? Volatility, uncertainty, and I think a lot of chaos and other things. But I always say, if we're firmly rooted in the word, we have so much at our disposal. Mm. Uh, when I am speaking, we have to say circular, because that's the other thing Christians. Circular doesn't mean the absence of God. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. where Christians have messed it up. That's we say, so no, the Constitution says we're a circular state. No, no, circular just means that we're not pre, we're not, how do I put it? We're not taking a uh, rooted church and saying, this is a state church. Mm. It just, it's not absence of God. It's just saying we don't have an official church mm. as the leading over us. And the way I look, I'm also challenged just to say when you get into these environments is, look, I also pray, say, oh, look, Holy Spirit. Because mm. if I have to believe when I read the word, the same God that helped Moses, the same God that helped David, I say, look, Holy Spirit, what should I say in this environment? Mm. And I think the best way sometimes to test our faith, uh, to say, look, the gifts that we've been given, because we've all been given something, is to say, help me to do it. Mm. And th that's why I'd leave it to say, your faith is not a Sunday faith. We, for me, I'd see Sunday as a, it's a half time. So it's a half time. So and I think if you're not pressing in with the Holy Spirit to be, because you're going to be uncomfortable. Let me not lie. This sounds easy. But when you're speaking to them, and uh, Seppo will tell you, like we have the privilege where you're sitting next to the former head of state. I want like, it hits you. Like, wow. You understand in this country, there's only been four or five people who've occupied this seat. It hits you that bad. Like, yo. And you do become a bit like yeah. that. But then it's to say, listen, that's when he takes over. Yeah. So I, I would say, listen, you have to challenge your faith. Start with something small as calling your counselor. Come on. Where it takes you from then on, look, it's, it's your Christ at the end of the day. Yeah. Beautiful. Guys, can we give uh, TK our friend? Uh, wow. Um, thank you.
Thank you, my brother. Um, thank you so much. Uh, what, a, what a privilege it's been. And, and, and my hope is that uh, this is just the beginning, that maybe we'll put something together where we can have a, a, a more extensive conversation, maybe even post-elections. It's like, well, what now, right? So here's where we are as a country. What now? What is the church's response? Um, but thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's, again, give him a... Um, so what now? Can I get a oh, water, please? Thank you. Um, wow, water. How do we respond? Thank you. Um, what now? In this very moment, what now? We're gonna we're gonna sing. Um, because I think singing is good. I think si singing is another way of communicating to our Father who is seated on His throne, who is fully in control. That not only are we desperate for you, but we come to you because you are the one who is in control of all things. So, so where the world might go, well, there's no hope, we say, no, there is hope. There is hope. Where, where the world might go, we exit. We go, no, we engage. So, so what now? So I, I'm going to leave you with three words, and I'll be real quick, because I know there is a, a real roast and a real oven. So I'll be real quick. Three words. Motivation, declaration, proclamation. Motivation, declaration, proclamation. Well, what does that mean? Well, well, here's the thing. I cannot motivate you to do anything. Now, I know you might go well, on it. I've heard some of your sermons and wow, it feels like motivation. No, no. Uh, thank you, but no. I can inspire you to do some stuff. We, we've heard this morning from our brother TK. He can inspire us to do stuff, but, but if, if you are going to bank on motivation, if you're going to leave here going, wow, I'm so motivated, here's the thing. It's only going to get you to Tuesday. And, and look, I know, like we have social media and, and clever hashtags and really cool campaigns and they motivate us but but motivation can only get us so far you know what the, the worst kind of motivation is self-motivation now i know i'm i'm really coming into your living room self-motivation is horrible as a child of god like we cannot will ourselves we we, we cannot pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and think that is what will sustain us to get to the end, that, that that is what will sustain us to keep going as, as we look through 2024 and we say, you know, there's an election year, it's very, very important, you know what, I just need to motivate myself. So, so motivation is not the answer. So what then? Oh, now what then should I do? Well, then I, I would say, and because I believe in the Word of God, then, then what you need is declaration. It is to declare something that is far greater than you, that is far greater than your ambitions, that is far greater than your idea, that is far greater than your political party that you're going to vote for, that is far greater than the constitution of this country. So what is that? What is that declaration? What is that thing that I can stand on and say with full confidence, knowing that, you know what? No matter what happens, this will remain true. Jesus, with his disciples, comes to a, a region called uh, Caesarea Philippi. If you know anything about, about Philipp Philippi, it's... it's it's a, it wasn't a very nice place to be. It's one of those places where you would say, what happens in Philippi stays in Philippi. In fact, I think people who lived in there would be like, no, we don't want these things to happen here. 
And so he takes them there. He doesn't take them to Santon. He, he, he doesn't take them to, to Waterkloof. He doesn't, he doesn't take them to, to Parliament. He doesn't, no, no, he doesn't even take them to the influencers and, and, and the movers and the shakers of that time. No, he takes them to Philippi, this place that, that was horrendous. And it's at that place that he, he gives a trailer attraction to what would happen at the cross. He, he introduces the church. Now I know you, we live in a time where, oh, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be long because the roast is in the oven, but we live in a time where we go, oh, the church, if I have time, I'll go. If I, if, if I have time, I'll be a part of. If I, like, we, we, we think of this, the, the church is that, that mm, if I may be. Failing to recognize that when Jesus on the cross dying for our sins. The, the, the Bible tells us that they, that they pierced his side and what came out was blood and water. What came out was blood and water. Oh, now why is that important? Well, it's because it's the blood of Jesus that purchases us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Oh, now why does water matter? Well, you know, here at Richard Fellowship, I love baptism Sundays. It's, it's the water that cleanses us. I was talking to my wife this past week and I was like, can I use this illustration? She was, so was, so was. blood and water I find it not convenient but from the very heart of God that he would go you know what in the same way that Eve came from the side of Adam that that the church would be birthed from the side, the pierced side of Jesus. But it's in Philippi that he, he, he intros the church and, and so he says this, he says, the text tells us when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say, or who do people say that the Son of Man is? That's a question that we get every day. Who do, who do people say Jesus is? in your workplace, uh, at your schools, uh, in your neighborhood, who, who is Jesus? And, and so they give an answer, they, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Everybody has an opinion on Jesus. And that's a, okay. In fact, it's a good thing. It's a great conversation starter. But here's what matters most. Verse 15, but, but you, he asked them, who do you say I am? Your mother can have an opinion. Your teacher can have an opinion. Your boss can have an opinion. Social media can have an opinion. But who do you say I am? And Peter, he often gets it wrong, but here he got it right. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ. You, you are who we have been waiting for. You are who has been promised to us. That is the declaration that I stand on. I don't need motivation. It's on that declaration. And then, and then I, I don't have time, but we... Jesus then goes on to say, he says, you know what, Simon Peter... You are the rock, and, and, and it's on that rock that I will build my church, and the, and the gates of, of hell will not stand. But, and there's a lot of confusion there, but, but if we get into it, there's, there's no real confusion. Jesus is not saying that, no, Peter, I'm not going to build a church on you. I'm going to build the church on that declaration. You are 
the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. I got one more word for you. So motivation won't get you there. Motivation will do nothing for us. It's declaration. Declaring that Jesus is who he says he is. And then the last one is proclamation. It's us now going and telling others about what we declare. I mean, what use is it if you, I believe, but no one knows. I trust in Jesus, but no one knows. What, what, we, we covered this last week. What, that's like salt that has no worth anymore. It's lost its saltiness. And so we proclaim. We proclaim, not on our works, but on his works. He's finished work. What is the hope for this country? It's Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. And my hope is that we would declare that here this morning. Oh, I, I pray that we would declare, I, I am in desperate need of a savior. And his name is Jesus. And so we're going to sing in response. But as we respond, I know I make fun of those who say that they respond in their heart, which is great. It's a great starting place. But it's got to move from your heart to your hands and your feet. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to respond. We're going to stand. So let's go ahead and stand. And then we're going to sing. But I recognize that there are folks in here today who were like, I came to hear a message and I got a conversation and it was great. But you, you're not a Christian. Coming to church does not make you a Christian. Growing up in a Christian home does not make you a Christian. Those are all incredible things. And praise Jesus for all of them. But it's when you declare that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And so I want to I want to open up that opportunity for you. If you're here, and, and I say our biggest danger is that we, we live in somewhat a Christian nation. So everyone assumes that they are a Christian. But you might be here today and you go, you know what, I'm actually not a Christian. Because I have not declared. I've said the words, I've ticked the box, but I have not surrendered my life to Jesus. I, I, I want you to know that today is the day that you can trust Him for everything. You can trust Him for salvation. Motivation will not get you there. And so if that is you here this morning, I want you to know it is as simple as saying, I cannot do this on my own, Jesus, I need you. I am not the master of my own destiny, Jesus, I need you. I am not in control of my life, Jesus, I need you. And so if that's you, I just simply want you to, I know we don't do this often, but I, I simply want you to, as we sing, come up to the front. Grab, grab one of us here in the front. Usually our, our leaders are sitting in the front. Cause, cause that's what leaders do. And just grab him and be like, yo, I, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. And with 100% certainty, I know he will save you. But maybe you have crossed the line of faith. Maybe you're going, yo, no, that's not me. But you know what? I've given up. I've, I've done some of the things that T TK was saying, like, uh, whatever, you know. I've got my own situation. I can get solar in my house. I drive my fancy car. I live, I live however I want. I've just kind of given up. Well, this is an opportunity for God to reignite, to reignite, to reignite that fire that we are supposed to have. And so if that's you, I would encourage you to come up front. Like, guys, we have these, these cushions here for you to, to bend the knee. Why do we bend the knee? Because it's, it, is, it is us going, I submit. I submit. 
And so you're coming and saying, I, I, I lay it all down again, Lord. Help me to see you for who you are and put my trust in you. And so if that's you, I'm going to, again, as we, like, don't, don't wait for me to come up. Don't, like, just come. Come to the front and, and just lay it all down and say, this is so overwhelming. All of this is overwhelming. The economy, politics, life, it's all overwhelming. And so I just lay it all down. And so, Father God, we come now asking that you would do this thing that we are all in desperate need of, and that is to save us. Help us, Lord Jesus. Help us to see you for who you are. That if we are to look in the mirror, and, and, and that mirror is the Word of God, if we are to, to, to stand and to look at the Word of God, we recognize that, 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 that we are that we are all sinful, that we all fall short. But praise Jesus that you came on a rescue mission for us. That you did not leave us in, in the pit of depravity, that you did not leave us there, but rather you came and you initiated and you stretched out your hand of grace and mercy and love. And so the question is today, will we respond by taking hold of your hand? Father, we worship you. We glorify you. We are in desperate need of you. And so I pray, Lord, I pray now that you would, that you would move us out the way. That some of us, we are so consumed with the the keeping up of appearances, that, that what matters most to us is our dignity before men instead of our devotion to you. Would you save many? Would you heal many? Would we be released from whatever it is that's holding us captive? You're the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Pray all of this. In the matchless, undefeated, victorious name of Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus over our circumstances, over our country, over all of it. We speak the name of Jesus. In your name we pray.